Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on the primates of Northeast India. Thank you for joining us. I am Sanika Kulkarni, currently an intern with the Nature's Eye. So uh, primates are the most varied group of extant mammals and are highly visual, lively and clever creatures, but they do not have the sharpest hearing. They cannot fly, nor are they efficient hunters like tigers or leopards. So in this talk, we shall know about their lives and their importance in the land of large mammals like rhinos and elephants. Before we proceed, I would like to introduce my team members, Vaishali, Pragyan, Abhishek and Harshita. So the Nature's Eye, powered by Wildlife Park, is a group of nature enthusiasts who wish to share their knowledge and experience with the world. We strive to bring informative and educational content from the tiny living world to city dwellers. Our motto is to empower environmentalists by creating opportunities, not only for budding environmentalists, but for the people from other fields as well. We work on bridging ecology and economy. We highly appreciate working with enthusiasts of ecology and nature who wish to bring change by spreading education and awareness. This webinar is one such attempt within the training and internship program, which we are a part of. There are a number of such events in line to look forward to in the future as well. Now, coming towards today's event, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Narayan Sharma. Dr. Sharma is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Biology and Wildlife Sciences at Cotton University, Guwahati. He is also an adjunct professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore. He has attained his doctoral degree from National Institute of uh, Advanced Studies and Manipal University and pursued postdoctoral research at the Nature Conservation Foundation in Mysore. Dr. Sharma has over two de decades of experience in the field of and wildlife research. He has conducted several workshops for students in reputable institutions like IISC Bangalore and IIT Guwahati. He has also worked on numerous projects, including collaborative projects with the with Aisar Tirupati at the national level, as well as the University of Cambridge and Christian Mikkelsen Institute in Bergen, Norway at the international level. Dr. Sharma incorporates modern developments in the field while teaching young minds, thus nourishing and molding a new brigade of ecologists and wildlife biologists from the Northeastern region of India. He's an advocate for citizen science and takes initiative to take ecological and environmental sciences to the general public and popularize it. A very good evening and hearty welcome to you, sir. Before I hand over the session to our speaker, I request all the participants to please keep themselves muted. Everyone, please join with the same name you have entered by registering in the Google form. If you have any queries, please type it down in the chat box. Our team will be monitoring it. There will be a question answer session at the end of the webinar and the attendance link will be shared later, which has to be filled in order to obtain your e-certificate. Again, I repeat, please keep yourself muted and the e-certificate will only be provided to those participants who fill the attendance sheet. Thank you everyone once again. Over to you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you so much, uh, Sanika. Uh, in, it's indeed my great pleasure to interact with uh, so many students here who have joined this uh, webinar. Uh, so let me share the Uh, it, is it visible the screen yes sir, it's, it's visible okay so okay thank you so much uh, once again uh, so when pragyan uh, called me and asked me to give a talk uh, and he uh, asked me to give a talk on the primates of northeast india and uh, I readily agreed for that. Uh, so mainly because uh, he was telling that uh, the wonderful work that you guys are doing and uh, 
uh, so it's it's a great opportunity to connect with uh, the like-minded people and uh, uh, people who are very much interested in conserving the wildlife uh, so let me begin with uh, some quiz so who doesn't I identify this animal I guess everyone right so can can someone just uh, unmute and just say what is this Bengal tiger thank you tiger okay great that's the correct answer and how many of you know this animal rhinoceros rhinoceros which one one horn rhinoceros one horn one and rhinoceros excellent so how many of you know this chap Anybody? Okay. Uh, I'm afraid not. How many of you know this animal? White chipmunk. Tir can't answer. Okay. Okay, I won't answer. Because that's your photograph. Okay. So, how many of you know this animal? I can't answer, no? No, not at all. Okay. Okay. So now it's become difficult, right? So the first two was the easiest one. Then the third one was difficult. Fourth one is still difficult. And fifth one is still difficult, right? And uh, just let me give you the answer. So the first one was the Sela macaque, which is called the Macaca Selai. And uh, the second one, uh, which Titi rightly said, was white chick macaque or macaca leucogenes. And the third one is the Arunachal macaque. And uh, very interestingly, all three are found only in Arunachal Pradesh in India. Okay. So uh, we know uh, the most charismatic species, but uh, unfortunately, we do not know about this uh macaques or these primates which are there in our country right and particularly from the northeast india and this also uh, this these three individuals are also uh, very uh, interesting uh, because they have recently been discovered okay uh, so they were there uh, i'll not say exactly discovered but uh, uh, they are new to science Okay, but people, the local people uh, knew about these primates for a long, long time. Okay, but uh, the, uh, the advanced scientific methods put uh, these three species in a, in a uh, different species level. Okay, so uh, that means the Northeast India is still a biological frontier. Okay, so it's uh, like if uh, people are finding new species which are uh, species which are new to science that means this area is uh, still unexplored right the even the species like uh, very conspicuous species like macaques are there in our in, in plain sight and we are not able to identify them right uh, so that means the area is still not explored fully right just think about other other species like uh, beetles, butterflies, or plants, or say other non-charismatic species. Okay. Uh, so, so before going forward, uh, so this is a regular exercise that I do in my class. Uh, just let's uh, uh, get uh, accustomed or let know what the primate is. So, uh, anybody has. Uh, any answer about what is a primate? How will you define a primate? My students are uh, not supposed to answer. First semester student can answer because they haven't uh, gone through these slides. Okay, let me check. There are chats. Okay. So what is a what is a primate? Anybody? How will you define a primate? So when you saw a monkey, right? 
the just the third uh, third uh, monkey that uh, then immediately the first thing that came into mind is that uh, this is a, a monkey right so what made you think think that that way okay so so let's start with the, some of the in, interesting characters so so primates have flat nails instead of claws okay so if you, if you look at yourself uh, this is my finger some one decade old finger so so i have nail right and i'm a primate so most of the primate species have flat nail instead of claws there are some primates they uh, still have claws but uh, most of the primates have the flat nails uh, second is that they have a flexible hand and feet okay uh, with the opposable thumb opposable thumb is a, is, a, is a very interesting characteristics of primate because it help primates to grab okay so grab the branches uh, grab a pain and write grab a uh, say a spoon and eat right for the for the humans so so it, it's a very very important uh, anatomical characteristic that gives primate an added advantage right and they also have prehensile tail so prehensile tail is the characteristic of the new world primates so new world primates are those primates which are found in south america and uh, central america uh, so they are, uh, these prehensile tails are also called the fifth limb okay uh, so the the tail uh, the ventral side of the tail is uh, hairless and uh, the primate use this as a uh, as one of the limb to reach out to the foods which are otherwise inaccessible okay and they also they have a binocular vision so in in the evolutionary time so uh, so our vision become binocular so when you when you look at one object so actually we are looking through the both eyes so we have a binocular vision and we have a very very intricate and the large brain if you if you if you look at this two graph so on the left hand side uh, so if you look at the percentage of body mass made up by the brain you'll see that humans are at the top and second is the chimpanzee and the elephants are are also there okay but uh, it's compared to the body size the brain is much much larger in human and other uh, uh, primates and uh, if you look at the right uh, graph so on the y-axis is the cerebral cortex neuron which are in billions and on the x-axis are different uh, animals right so even even here humans we have large number of cerebral cortex neurons and you compare this with other species the ele elephants are also there uh, but if you look at chimpanzee gorilla they have much more uh, cerebral cortex so what uh, this uh, uh, does was the primates are able to perform certain very complex fun functions okay because of the availability of the uh, neuron and uh, most of the primates are social animals so they, though there are some solitary uh, kind of a social organization but but if you look at the primate groups they are mostly social okay they, they live in a group of either pair living or uh, there are multi-male multi-female troop and up to the something called the super troop or something like that okay and this is the diverse social organization so the first is uh, the know you um, so which is a uh, fancy word for uh, solitary individuals and then pair living for example you know about uh, hula gibbon which are uh, Though they call it monogamous but uh, the strict monogamy uh, in given is questionable and they live in pair and then there are the polyandrous that means a female uh, mate with multiple um, <clears throat> males and then then there are the polygyny where a male uh, mate with the multiple female then polygynandrous that means there are multiple multi-male multi-female kind of a troop and then there are the fusion fusion kind of a troop the the group uh, fuse uh, to become a group and then again they fuse uh, they disperse okay uh, and then there is a multi-level society where uh, uh, 
uh, in, in some cases there are the uni mail and the evening uh, different uh, 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 other groups comes together and form a multi-level society and sometimes the two or three groups come together and the and they roost or they live uh, together uh, in the evening so they form a super troop okay so these are the diverse kind of a social organization if you ask me uh, so how how do you define the social organization in primates so these are these are the diversity okay and then now if i ask you so these are the some of the characteristics that 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 i have told you uh, and uh, if i ask you now what is a primate so you your answer will be so it will it is not defined by a single characters but it is defined by a different combinations of characters so the the few few characters i have i have told you uh, so what what they mean and then you can, you can see that uh, there are these other characters characteristics also uh, which are there in the primate so it, it is very very difficult to single out one characters so that define a primate so we need to we need to always keep in mind that there are the different kind of a combinations of character that define a primates now uh, where are the di distributors so primates are not distributed everywhere okay uh, so if you look at the map here so uh, if you look at the equator okay so uh, from the equator if you look at uh, the 30 degree north and the 30 degree south right in this belt which is which is also uh, the tropical belt so most of the primates are distributed almost 90 uh, 9 percent primates are distributed in this belt exceptions are there barbary macaques which are which is there in morocco uh, and gibraltar and uh, japanese macaque is the like uh, the northernmost uh, primate species which are found in japan okay otherwise rest of these primates are distributed in the uh, in this 30 degree north and the 30 degree south belt uh, from the equator okay uh so do you have any idea how many primate species are there in the world i'm not talking about the subspecies level only the species so perhaps this uh, number is also outdated now any idea 100 200 300 1000 2000 okay uh 15 to 20 maybe okay Supraja said 15 to 20. Devan said 300. Okay, anybody else? Ankita also said 300. Okay. So you'll be surprised to know. Yeah, Baisali, I think, is very close. Very correct. So it, there are around 504 species of primates. Okay. So this number, I think it's not a like a stable number. This keep changing. Okay. So perhaps uh, we can add one or two more because the Sela macaque was not there. So perhaps it's 505. Perhaps by the time I prepared this slide a um, few months back uh, to this uh, uh, time, I think there must be some ed more addition. So and if you look at the primate distribution, uh, you will see that the most primates richness continent is the South America. So where, it, where you find 171 species. And uh, Africa is 111 and uh, South Asia and the Southeast Asia 119. And if you look at this tiny island, so what's the name of this island? Anybody can say uh, this island? Madagascar. 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 Very nice. So Madagascar has 103 individual uh, species of primates. And uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you know uh, what is Madagascar is known for. It is known for the lemurs. Okay. And all the species which are found in Madagascar and some of the uh, archipelago, uh, or some of the islands nearby are found nowhere else in the world. Okay. These are all 103 uh, primate species which are found in Madagascar are endemic species okay and uh, these are all lemurs okay and uh, though if you look at the size size of the Madagascar 
compared to the size, the prime matrices is much, much higher. But it is also true that most of the, the, these primates are also uh, facing tremendous threat from several factors. So most of them are uh, threatened. Uh, so here just I wanted to clarify two things is that um, so uh, we called new world monkeys the monkey primates which are found in South America and Mexico and we call primates which are found in Africa and uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia as the new world uh, old world primates okay all the lemur lorises monkeys and apps are uh, tarsiers uh, are part of the old world monkeys okay and all the squirrel monkeys or that uh, uh, the prehensile tail bala monkey all these are part of the new world monkeys okay so now coming back to india so any idea how many primates we have so there are roughly uh, so there are four groups of his, uh, primates okay uh, one is the lorises second is the gibbons third is macaques fourth is langurs uh, any idea how many of this out of 504? So how many species we have? Okay, 20 to 25 in India. Okay, 23. Uh, okay, they want say 50. Okay, 25. Yeah, I think we are more or less close. Okay, let's see. So there are two species of lorries in India. One is the slender lorries at the top and the below is the slow lorries. Okay. And lorises are mostly nocturnal species. Okay. And uh, there is one species of gibbon. Earlier, there were two species of gibbon, the Western uh, hula gibbon and the Eastern hula gibbon. So now, um, after a genetic analysis, people found that uh, the researcher found that that uh, the species which we are calling as a Eastern hula gibbon is in in fact the Western hula gibbon. In fact, so it, there is there is some sort of ambiguity about the um, Eastern hula gibbon. So Dr. Anwarudin Choudhury also said that this may be a subspecies of uh, uh, hula gibbon, and he uh, called them a different uh, species name. Uh, but uh, if you look at the macaques okay so there are how many macaques there are around 10 species of macaques we have okay the first one is the bonnet macaque uh, stump tail macaque lion tail macaque asimis macaque pigtail macaque arunachal macaque uh, white cheek macaque andaman uh, this long tail macaque rhesus macaque and this is the new macaque species which is the cella macaque and we have we are also reaching in terms of langurs okay langurs there is still the taxonomy is still ambiguous but uh, uh, thanks to um, some of the researcher uh, from the ces uh, center for ecological sciences at ias bangalore so uh, for for the time being the taxonomy uh, of langurs is resolved okay so earlier there were uh, seven species of well, langurs, common langurs in, in India, like uh, the one species was divided into seven species, but now there are four species. So these are uh, fairy leaf monkey uh, and the uh, golden langur, which is endemic to Assam and Bhutan, and uh, cap langur, then uh, uh, nilgiri langur. Then there are these four different uh, langurs species. Okay. The Hanuman langur is divided into now uh, four uh, species. Okay, uh, so India has now twenty-one primate species. Okay, so uh, don't remember this number. Just keep changing uh, because uh, with the advent of the new uh, molecular technology and uh, DNA technology, so uh, the the langur taxonomy. I think langurs are the most uh, like a uh, with the langurs, the taxonomy actually fluctuates this uh, number very significantly. Okay, so I, I remember a few uh, months back, I think few years back, I was giving a talk and I was saying India is twenty-four primate species. Okay, so don't stick to this number. So how many primate species in northeast India? So there are, so uh, slender lorries are not found in northeast India. Bonnet macaque. Uh, lion tail macaque and the 
crab eating macaque or long tail macaques are not found in india uh, northeast india and all these four uh, langurs are or five langurs including nilgiri langurs are not found in northeast india so i was i was just uh, uh, thinking about what what is the langur species which is there in sikkim and and apparently there is this himalayan grey langur was cited i think uh, i just uh, so that three days back it has been cited from Sikkim. So I think if you add that, we then we'll have a four langurs. So Northeast India has 12 primate species. So this roughly translates into the 57 percentage of primate species which are found in India. Uh, so the contribution of uh, Northeast India is around the 57 percent. So 57 percent uh, primate species found in India are found in Northeast India. Okay, and this is what I was uh, talking about the uh, the Langu taxonomy. Little bit complex, but uh, for the time being, we are settled with these four Langur species. Earlier there was only one, then it is split it into seven Langur species, and again from the genetic analysis or uh, the morphology and the behavior. So uh, by uh, Parvin Karant and his team. So we are now saying that there are four Langur species in North, uh, India. Right? And if you see Northeast India, we still do not have uh, the uh, any Langur species. So it's except for Sikkim. So, so Northeast India is, uh, is quite remarkable. So uh, you, you may ask why uh, so much uh, uh, richness so much biodiversity is there in northeast india so uh, one of the factor is that this uh, this place is the uh, is located at the confluence of three uh, biogeographical realm right so we have a uh, oriental uh, elements we have a paleartic uh, origin and we also have species which are indian origin okay so like a mainland indian origins and the river Brahmaputra is, is one of the biggest barrier for the dispersal of many primate species. So the prim some of the primate species which are found uh, uh, in south of river Brahmaputra are not found in the north of the Brahmaputra. For example, the golden langur is only found uh, towards the north of river Brahmaputra. Okay? And uh, stamp tail macaque, pig tail macaque and the hula gibbons, they are found only in the south of the river Brahmaputra, whereas there are some species like the slow lorries, rhesus macaque and the asamis macaque and cap langurs which are found in the both sides of the river Brahmaputra. And uh, the, the, the diversity in habitat, you know, the, the, the altitudinal variation, particularly in Arunachal Pradesh is the perfect uh, uh, site for the species, okay. Uh, so some allopatric species and can happen and uh, this is the reason why uh, there was a cellar pass here there, there is a cellar pass here so east of cellar pass is uh, the Munjala uh, west of cellar pass is the Munjala and the east uh, they, they found that that uh, species is very very different from the Arunachal macaque and they coined that uh, species as the cellar, um, cellar macaque okay so this gives a perfect re recipe for uh, the species. So that's why Northeast India is so rich in uh, say biodiversity, including private diversity. So let's let's talk a little bit about the ecology and behavior of Northeast uh, primates. So I do I cannot go into detail about all of this uh, the ecology and behavior of all of these primate species. So it, it it will take a I think whole day. So I'll I'll give you very brief say snippets about some of the interesting behavior that I've been observing or uh, I've been reading on this primate species. So uh, slow lorries, as, uh, as the name suggests, are slow, but uh, but mark my word, they're not slow at all. So if threatened, they can, they can really walk very, very fast, okay? And interestingly, slow lorries are the on world's only venomous primates, right? So how many of you uh, know about this? So if you are handling slow lorries, please do not handle with the bare hands, okay? So they have this brachial gland and if they are uh, agitated, 
the brachial gland can secrete some uh, liquid which is uh, very very uh, foul smelling and pseudolaris will uh, lick the fluid from the brachial gland and they mix the fluid with the saliva and then when they bite it the mixture of saliva and the liquid from the brachial gland uh, can uh, act as a, as a venom so we are we are calling it a venomous primate because they insert the uh, uh, the whatever liquid or cocktail or the concoction directly into the uh, blood stream so that's why you call them as a venom just like a snake bite okay uh, most of this venomous snake bite it's just, just like that so it may not be fatal uh, but it can give a really bad time for researcher who are handling uh, lorises barehanded okay so people didn't know about it earlier so this is the recent uh, finding then uh, gibbons i think uh, most of you have heard about gibbons so gibbons are sexually dimorphic so males are black in color and the females are pen brown in color and uh, so interestingly uh, when the baby is born and when the baby is two years old the both male and female uh, infant or juveniles are a black in color so when they, they attain the uh, age of six okay uh, if it's a male it's a female then they slowly turn their coat color into brown okay and if they are male they will keep the black color, okay and gibbons are also known for uh, 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 arboreal so they are mostly arboreal arboreal means they mostly confine themselves in the uh, canopy of the trees canopy of the forest that means for them the continuous forest is the prerequisite for their survival okay uh, so if there is a breakage of um, so canopy break or there is a um, the forest become fragmented then the future of gibbons are also uh, uh, in danger okay uh, and you may you may also think uh, if they are uh, always on the in the canopy from where they get water so i have i have documented this very strange behavior of gibbon uh, drinking water okay so this is this is uh, people knew about it that there were anecdotal evidences but i i got this footage from during my PhD in the uh, Holongapar Gibbon Wildlife Sanctuary. I just wanted to share the video. So the earlier assumption was that, earlier uh, the, uh, uh, observation was that the gibbons leak the dew, they uh, eat uh, tender leaves, uh, and because they are also eating a lot of fruits, fruits contain water. So they, the water requirement for gibbon was fulfilled by those uh, different food items. but. I have documented this uh, one and which is adding one more say, information about uh, from where given uh, procure water. So I just wanted to play this video. Can you see that? So what it is doing is there is a branch which is broken and there is a uh, hole there, tree hole. Okay, and uh, all the rainwater which is uh, accumulated there, the gibbon will insert its hand. Okay, and it is not like a scooping the water and drinking it. So it will it will uh, uh, put his fingers. Okay, and then uh, whatever water is dripping from those fingers, and uh, it will. Uh, drink it okay so 
so if, if the whole tree hole is quite large apparently so given could have uh, inserted his uh, head and uh, drink it directly from the hole but i think the tree hole was not that big that's why uh, the given was inserting his hand and drinking water like that okay and uh, i just wanted to share this small video that is uh, uh, i got it from uh, uh, the round glass and gibbons are known for duet okay so they are the most musical uh, species in in tropical forest okay uh, so why do gibbon call so uh, we all know that why bird call right so gibbons and some perhaps the howler monkeys also call okay so there are there are three reasons one is that uh, uh, the, they call it to advertise their territory and gibbons are territorial okay what is territorial means that part of their home range okay they defend actively okay they defend uh, through the call okay that means they are advertising that this is my territory please do not enter so this is the advertisement to the other group okay uh, uh, by saying that okay this is my territory and please do not enter into my territory because they are territorial species. First, second is that, uh, so the call is also, uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a duet, so it also helps the social cohesion, okay? And, and it, is, it is very interesting that, uh, so given in winter, they call less, okay, compared to the summer. So we uh, so there is a reason for that also. So because winter the the fruit availability is very low and and as you know the call is very energy uh, like a requiring exercise right. So since there are less fruit, less uh, less energy, so they will call alternatively. Okay, but summer when there are plenty of fruits uh, available, they call almost on a regular basis and. And you will be very interested, surprised to know that um, the researchers are using given call to estimate their densities. So there are different uh, methods of doing it. Uh, so if you are interested, I can I can send it to you those uh, reading material, or you can just search in the Google Scholar. So about uh, so use given call to estimate their densities. Okay, uh, I think I'll just skip this one, or I'll just play this song. sings an elaborate duet, ending in a crescendo. A family unit of two to five gibbons, with a single adult male and female pair, guard their territory with these calling rituals. No intrusion is tolerated. Hulog gibbons bear for life and live on tree canopies, using their arms to swing through continuous stretches of forest. They mostly eat fruits and defecate seeds throughout their path. Unwittingly scattering seeds and regenerating the forest. They are the true guardians of these forests. Gibbons are the only apes found in India. The Hulog gibbon depends on a connected forest canopy. 
However, human development has cut through their habitat, pushing them to the brink of extinction. They are confined to the northeast and their population is declining rapidly. Okay, so that's it about uh, the gibbons. So let's move on to the macaques. So macaques uh, are actually very versatile species. So they have a Catholic diet. That means they uh, they eat a lot of uh, the, the the diet breadth is very very wide. Okay, they can they can eat leaves, they can eat fruits, they can eat uh, uh, say nectar, they can eat resins, they can eat uh, root roots. So they have a very very diverse kind of a uh, say uh, diet. Okay, uh, so in northeast India, so we have. Uh, seven uh, macaque species and uh, e when i was working in holangapar uh, gibbon wildlife sanctuary so i, I was working with the, uh, so I, I was intended to work on the four primate species there like a uh, four macaque species there but unfortunately i didn't find the assamese macaque there so which i i cited in 2005 after that i haven't cited them uh, in in holangapar uh, gibbon wildlife sanctuary and uh, i worked uh, on three species of macaques. One is the uh, storm tail macaque, pigtail macaque, and the uh, rhesus macaque. And if you look at the pigtail macaque, the pigtail macaque has this very nice, uh, say, uh, v shaped uh, black marking on, on his forehead. Okay. Storm tail macaque, as the name suggests, are the tail is very, very small. So it's almost a non existing tail. And the tail of the pig tail is, as, as its name suggests, it looked like a tail of a pig. And rhesus macaque is, is the most ubiquitous primates in, uh, in most of the part of the Northeast India and also the Northern India. Okay. So I looked at uh, the three um, primate species, but I'm just showing you one video of uh, the storm tail macaque, which is um, very least known species. So compared to gibbons or say uh, golden langur, uh, so this is very very least known species in fact the pigtail macaques are also very least known so i'm just playing this video you know, just to show you uh, the amazing uh, days that i used to have while following the stump tail macaque groups in given wildlife sanctuary just have a look at it
So uh, as you see that uh, the most of the time uh, they are on ground, so they are mostly terrestrial species. Uh, but uh, during uh, when it's become uh, like evening uh, to sleep, they choose the very tall uh, trees, okay, uh, with the huge branches. So you'll be also surprised to know that we have recorded the largest troop of stumptail macaque from uh, Gibbon Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, consisting of 194 individuals in one single group. So this is kind of a, a new uh, uh, discovery for all of us. So 194 individuals walking in, in forest, okay, so in, in single group. Uh, so then next is uh, the langur, three, three species of langurs, fairies leaf monkey uh, at the top and uh, golden langur as most of you know about golden langur because it's an endemic to Assam and Bhutan and the cap langur. So these three langurs are also called the leaf monkey because uh, they they uh, they eat leaves. So the predominant uh, diet is leaves. And you'll be surprised to know that uh, uh, compared to say gibbons or macaques, they eat more leaves. Uh, can anybody tell me why they, why, uh, they eat leaves? Okay, because they can digest leaf. Okay, so they are uh, they can break down their stomach can break down the cellulose. Okay, that's why uh, the the leaves are available uh, in the forest and uh, some of my friends who are working with the cap langur they were saying that almost seventy percent time they were resting, but uh, actually they are not resting. They were digesting the leaves. Okay, most of the time you will see langurs sitting and uh, just uh, laying out, but that is not the case. So they were actually digesting the tough cellulose from the leaves. And uh, so they also need protein, right? So all, all, the, all the macaques or all the animals need protein, right? Macaques, they can, they can eat, uh, say, uh, insect or you, know, you have seen that they were also eating mushrooms. Gibbons also eat a lot of insect, lorises. Uh, most of most of the lorises are insectivorous and langurs can fulfill their insect needs through the by consuming the tender leaves okay tender leaves has much more uh, protein content than the uh, little mature leaves they do eat a lot of fruits as well so it's not like they do not eat fruits they do eat fruits but predominantly they are the uh, leaf eaters okay so unfortunately, the world primates are threatened. Okay, so over fifty percent now. I think the the recent uh, Ayushian, uh the status has uh, said that the sixty eight percent of all primates are threatened. So threatened means it's, it's a category. That means they are either vulnerable, they are uh, or endangered or critically endangered. So if you look at the threatened uh, species of primates, uh, you will see that. Uh, the uh, globally, okay. Uh, the, so the, this is a little bit older uh, records. Uh, Seventy-five percent uh, species are facing population decline, right? And the neotropics or the uh, South America or the Central America, the uh, number is little lower than what it. Uh, is it in Madagascar and the Asia? So Madagascar almost hundred uh, percentage species populations are declining. Asia, it's 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 very very close to ninety five percent. So I think these numbers are changing now. Okay, and there are certain species which are committed to extinction. For example, this Hainan gibbon, uh, which are found in uh, Hainan uh, Island in China. So there are only twenty two individuals left. Similarly, the northern sportive lemur, which are found in Madagascar, less than 50 individuals are remaining. 
and a katba langur which are found in vietnam there are less than 65 individuals left in the world okay so these species are committed to extinction unless we do some some uh, some drastic measures to revive this population right or uh, in some time uh, we we may we really want to be optimistic that we can bring this species back from the extinctions but with only 122 individuals it's it's look little bit uh, difficult right so uh, the first thing what we need to do is to not uh, push the species to this kind of a critical numbers uh what are the conservation threats to northeast primates so the biggest threat that i that i can conceive uh, in northeast india is the habitat loss habitat fragmentation and degradation in fact this is one of the most uh, say uh, important factors that driving world's primate into extinction towards extinctions so the, the fortunately we haven't lost a single species of primate in last millennium okay but that doesn't mean that uh, the primates are safe so what uh, what that means that primates are carrying certain debt okay that means uh, they are already committed uh, that uh, the population will decline because uh, since they are long living animals 25 uh, years or 30 years or 35 years different uh, species have different uh, life spans so so the the, the only thing is that uh, it it's just the delay the the uh, number of uh, primate species that is going to extinct in in this century uh, is inevitable there will be some species that will go extinct and the habitat loss fragmentation degradation is pushing these species to um, say uh, towards the uh, uh, oblivion and this is one of the sites where i worked uh, since uh, 2001 uh, this site is called the borajan uh so borajan is a small forest fragments which are uh, located in tinsukia district of assam and this is just the 5 square kilometer area so uh, till 19 uh, in 1960s so anwar din choudhury has reported uh, that uh, stumptail smokaks were also present in 2001 when we went we we encountered five species of primates in this tiny and tiny island right and uh, since then there is a dramatic decline in Uh, their population so the 1995 and 1997 data are from uh, uh, srivastava and uh, they recorded 35 individuals in 1995 this individuals is uh, the number of individuals have given have come and 2019 and perhaps in 2022 also uh, i think there are only four individuals of given left in the start tiny and tiny island okay it is just a matter of time that this four will also go extinct because there is only single group right so either you can uh, relocate this group somewhere else or bring back some uh, other uh, groups and introduce them to this area but the habitat is is deteriorating every day so when we look look at the land use and land cover map of borajan if you can see all this uh, dark green is the is the kind of intact forest and what is the light green is the open forest and you can make it out that since 1995 uh, till 2018 we have lost lots of uh, intact forest in borajan and this is one of the reason why uh, the given populations have also uh, declined drastically so the forest was already fragmented then there is a degradation inside the forest patches so which has resulted into um, the the precipitous decline of uh, gibbons in borazan uh, so these are these are some of the other fragments where i worked and uh, in almost all these fragments gibbons are declining so berjan padumani and borazan most of this uh, the borazan i have already said about the gibbons but cap langur assamese macaque pigtail rhesus macaque also so there is a declining trend and except for the olangapar gibbon wildlife sanctuary where the primate are increasing okay but uh, we haven't done this survey uh, after uh, to 2008 very thorough survey to after 2008 to compare its data we did a survey in 2016 but uh, uh, we we have to do it 
one more time to uh, sexually assist the population of this species, whether they are again increasing. So one one you know, one very promising um, finding is that the stump-tailed macaques are growing in number there, but we do not know about the other species. And one very interesting uh, uh, threat that we, we generally ignore is that the forest is there, the land is there, right? But we uh, do not consider the chronic extraction of resources uh, from this forest. Uh, most of this forest looks good from the canopy, but if you go inside, uh, the forest, uh, the floor is almost empty. There are no saplings, though there are the shrubs or the small small trees are all, almost all of them are gone, right? So the the forest is dying from within, and because of uh, the unregulated and the chronic resource extraction from this forest. So another, uh, and we did a survey uh, in in Holangapar uh, Gibbon Wildlife Sanctuary, and we we found that over twenty five percentage of extracted materials are the key resources of the primates. So that means people are also extracting the resources which are meant to be um, for the for the uh, for the primates of uh, that particular sanctuary. So you can think about if uh, this continue for a longer period of time. So there will be dearth for uh, say food for the primate species. In so that was just the just the one one forest fragment. It can happen in so other fragments as well. And in Upper Assam, where I work, the expansion of tea cultivation is like historically in the past and the current also, and perhaps in the future also, this is going to be one of the one of the major concern because most of the tea gardens were established after clearing forest. So some of the places where there are this forest called the unclassified state forest, they are being cleared and the, the tea gardens are being established in those areas. And uh, uh, one of the important threat to primates uh, in this part of the uh, country is the hunting. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, debate about whether hunting is good or bad. I do not want to go into this. Uh, I just wanted to share some information about uh, when I was working uh, on a survey of Hula Gibbon in Mizoram. So I failed to find a single individual of rhesus macaque. Uh, in uh, in most of these protected areas, I, I did find uh, hula gibbon, Assamese macaques, cap langurs, uh, and uh, other other species there, uh, fairies leaf monkey. But uh, I I didn't find uh, a single rhesus macaque. So they are they're they're almost not uh, encountered in any of these forest forest fragments, like a forest of Mizoram. Okay. So hunting is going to be a very, very uh, important factor that's contributing to uh, the declining of species. And uh, another is that the negative human wildlife interaction. I'm not, not saying uh, it, is a, it is a conflict. So uh, though people are living very uh, in harmonious with uh, uh, primates in, in many, many part of the Northeast India, Barikuri, there is a village. Uh, where people are uh, living harmoniously with uh, hula gibbon in, in Garvils also, people uh, there are gibbons in, in people's uh, villages. Okay, uh, but, but this negative human uh, primate interactions is going to be a major issue, uh, and uh, I think uh, most of the people are facing it because, but primarily because of the one species of primate that is the rhesus maca. And uh, all of you know the the northeast india has a great potential for the hydroelectric uh, power and all these are uh, proposed or already uh, established dams in uh, particularly this area of uh, arunachal and arunachal pradesh where uh, you have seen that there are in the last few years like as almost one decade or so uh, so we have been uh, finding new spaces there. So I think these are also places where the big dams are coming. So this is going to be a major issue for the continuous survival of primates in this part of the country. And uh, the one of the potential threat that can uh, eliminate the good primate habitat is the oil palm, palm expanse. So there is a there is a huge incentive 
from the government uh, to open up this forest okay uh, uh, and expand uh, oil palm, palm into into most of these uh, areas okay and that the oil palm all of you know what what they have created in the indonesia and the malaysia so the orangutans very survival of places so oil palm can be can have a tremendous impact for the continuous survival of not only the primates but the species which which are dependent on the tropical forest and linear infrastructure i think very less uh, uh, work has been done uh, in the impact of the linear infrastructure on primate uh, survival so this image is from uh, hulanga par given wildlife sanctuary i was uh, walking uh, to my field site uh, in the morning uh, and i encountered this troop while coming back uh, i just stumbled on these individuals and i was as wondering what is this then i i found that this individual was uh, hit by a train and he died uh, the mining again uh, in, in most of the uh, tropical rich forest uh, are also the place where there are a lot of minerals which are beneath uh, them and that makes them the ideal candidate for mining and uh, while doing that uh, the lot of the forests are being cleared okay so this is also going to be a issue in the future for primates so you may ask uh, then why we need to conserve primates so why why don't we, we can just conserve uh, rhino or tiger or elephants so if, if you conserve them the idea is that if you conserve this uh, animal other animals are going to be uh, automatically safe so but this is not uh, happening right we need to conserve because primates are also a cultural and just uh, cultural icons in, in many tribes so if you go and talk to many many uh, people in northeast india they have certain belief system for primates they have folklores so with if the primates are not there right so uh, if the primates are uh, vanishing so along with that so we are also uh, being impoverished culturally and uh, uh the primates are also ecologically important so in that, in that video from uh, round glass we have seen that uh, the primates are uh, dispersing seeds okay uh, and they are helping a dispersal of seed from one area to another uh, so just think about it in in many areas if there are there are uh, no seed dispersion so all the large seed dispersal are vanish so like for example there are no hornbills right so in those areas uh, in those severely degraded areas you still find uh, rhesus maca right which can disperse seed of different trees so i think we need we really need a long term study to understand the importance of primates as a seed disperser in this area so though uh, there are some studies that has been done elsewhere in India and uh, uh, throughout the world. There are a lot of studies, but uh, we really need to work on uh, the seed dispersal mechanisms of primate in this forest. So to understand uh, and project, uh, say, primate uh, as a seed, uh, as a key di seed dispersal in absence of other seed dispersal which are vanished from this forest. And why study primates, right? So I love primates because the uh, the primates will let you let you come very very close, and they will show all the say behaviors. Uh, so you can you can observe their behavior in details. So it is not possible if you, you even with the elephants, with the tiger, or with the rhinos, you have to maintain a very uh, uh, healthy distance. Otherwise this animal will they are not very very friendly if you go very nearby right but primates if you if you can do uh, if you can follow them you can uh, actually you can follow them from the morning to the evening you can you can look into their lives lives uh, life social organization the behavior so perhaps the best uh, 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 say organisms or the animal groups from where you can get a lot of insights and 
so what I'm saying about uh, uh, flagship species here is that tropical, I think the tiger or elephants uh, may be important uh, flagship species. But for me, uh, the places where there are no tiger, the places where there are no, no rhinos, the places where there are no elephants. So what could be the flagship species in those places? For example, places like Mizoram, right? Or places like uh, Meghalaya. Meghalaya, there are no tigers. There are a lot of elephants. But uh, Mizoram, there are no tigers except for Dampa, uh, which is also uh, is a tiger reserve. And there are no elephants, uh, large group of elephants. So what could be the flagship species for those areas? So I think uh, if we can say a project primate or uh, say blog given in particularly or say other species as the flagship species, so we can conserve this tropical rainforest in those areas because they are. So I'm, I'm just saying it for the blog given because they need a contiguous forest. They need an undisturbed contiguous forest, right? Though they live in the secondary. Uh, disturbed forests as well, but uh, primarily if they they can they prefer the uh, undisturbed forests. So I think they can be a mascot for uh, so, so conservations of this tropical forest in northeast India. But so by by protecting the forest, I think primate can also protect other other uh, species in this uh, uh, tropical rainforest of northeast India. And uh, so this all are not say uh, very, very bleak uh, future that a lot of uh, interesting and uh, a lot of uh, say hopeful uh, signs are there, right? Uh, so people in general are tolerant towards primate in, uh, in Northeast India, right? Uh, though there are a lot of hunting happening, but uh, though there are a lot of this uh, crop depredation happening, but uh, people will not go in like a kill them in mass, right? Uh, so unlike uh, America or say Europe, where they completely finished uh, the wolf or many, many species. So we still have this cultural tolerance. So we still reward uh, primates as uh, as our God, right? Because of the Hanuman uh, thing. So, uh, and we still actually uh, share space with the primates. So I think there are still hope but I think uh, the main uh, agenda should be to restore the degraded forest uh, of, of all these areas. So if we really wanted to uh, say protect the future of primates in uh, Northeast India. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I, I, uh, I'm sure that there is still hope and some of you will get motivated uh, by this uh, talk and by this insight that I'm, I'm sharing with you. And uh, perhaps you will uh, take primatology as a career option and perhaps you will work uh, on primates and perhaps uh, you can also uh, help them, uh, help save them in the future. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for listening. So I stop you. Hello, Dr. Sarma. I think some of our participants has, have some questions. Yeah and i will be reading out the questions for you sure okay so banker donbar is asking hmm. uh, do they produce different calls for different events uh different events perhaps yes i think uh uh, there may be call variations. Uh, so we haven't uh, done that work. So there's a person called Gizman. I think he has done some work on uh, the primate vocalization, the given vocalization. Uh, I think it's not a fixed call, right? Uh, so that could be the, the call of, say, perhaps the uh, juvenile or the subadult is a little bit different than the call of the adult. So because they learn it. So there is social learning that's happening there. And perhaps they are also uh, call a uh, little bit differently in the different contexts, perhaps in different season as well. So uh, I don't have the 
uh, answer for this question here but i think this is yeah this is one area that that uh, uh, definitely we need to explore definitely thank you so much for that uh, question okay and he is again asking do different type of primates share the same territories among themselves exactly that they, they they do so so what i what i found uh, uh, ben pandor is that um, so they do uh, uh, so they, so i was looking at three primate species okay and uh, i was also opportunistically looking at uh, other two so total i was looking at the five species so uh, within uh, within the macaques uh, they share the same territory but they uh, exploit a different vertical uh, vertical space okay some of, of them are canopy dwellers so they exploit resources which are there in the canopy some of the uh, some of them are like a mid, mid canopy uh, feeder and and some of them are the forest foragers so the diet though they are sharing the same space like apartment you know so some of them are living on the third floor and some of them are living on the second floor and some of them are living on the ground floor and they are exploiting resources of these different layers so definitely they if you if you if you, if you mark the so if you uh, I, I could have shown you that one so within the territory of uh, say, say home range of uh, stumptail macaque you will see the pigtail macaque home range inside inside it then there are a lot of home range uh, territory of blockable but uh, so it's completely overlap but vertically they are partitioning so they are not partitioning horizontally but they are partitioning vertically and also if uh, both of them are vertical uh, uh, they are using vertical then they are also using different resources so that enable them to uh, say eat uh, coexist in the same place uh, despite of sharing the same uh, habitat. Okay. Then Amrita Jai Prakash is asking, how far has been the tribal and local communities been involved in the conservation activities of the primates in Northeast? Can the already existing percentage be increased and how? Absolutely. So that, that that's why I was telling that some of the, uh, like a, uh, uh, some of the brightest uh, things are coming from the community. So there is a, there is a place called Barikuri. Uh, so it's actually a village of so 20 hamlet. So, so where there are, uh, there, this is not a forest, this is entirely a human dominated landscape. So there are 19 individuals of uh, gibbons. So, and communities are taking care of this, uh, these gibbons. And uh, when I was working in Garo Hills, so there are gibbons in, in people's uh, people's villages, right? So if if somebody goes there and really they wanted to harm the people, will come and just uh, really uh, chase you away. So people are doing this kind of a conservation um, uh, say initiative, and and also in uh, uh, Meghalaya. Uh, so there are communities which are coming forward to protect the species. So unfortunately, most of this uh, are only for, uh, say, hula gibbon, uh, and uh, and uh, and there are communities in uh, uh, golden langur areas, right, where communities are protecting golden langurs. So, so I think uh, these are some of the brightest, uh, say, uh, examples where communities are coming and helping it. And yes, we, we can increase the percentage, but uh, for a, for a, from a species point of view, I think, uh, so what we need to uh, emphasize here that we need to protect and increase their natural habitat, right? Uh, so that, uh, and, and you know, like uh, it's uh, not always a best idea just to uh, say, if, uh, live very close proximity to say uh, wild animals right there may be a lot of uh, spillover the disease can from uh, the disease can jump from them to us and from us to them we do not know so perhaps the malaria or some other disease can spread to the gibbon population as well because uh, genetically we are we are quite compatible right so this can happen so but my Really, to restoration of the primary forest and increasing their population in their 
natural habitat. I think if you can do that, uh, I think uh, with the participation, of course, with the involvement of the community, I think uh, we can still uh, conserve a lot of time spaces in this part. And in fact, these are there are there are very very uh, interesting uh, signs of, of community getting involved. In. Okay. And the next question is from Mohammed Sabir Ahmed. He is asking: Is there crossbreeding among macaques? That's a very interesting question. So there are crossbreeding of I know about rhesus and bonnet macaque, and in fact rhesus and long tail macaque also there are. Uh, but I haven't seen them, though they. Uh, so in fact, in in Borajan. Uh, uh, and Bhairzan, so there are species which move together. So, rhesus and pigtails were moving together. I saw them moving together. Rhesus and Assamese macaque moving, moving together. There is a highly potential uh, of crossbreeding or hybridization there. Okay, so uh, we cannot uh, completely rule out that. So, I think we need, uh, need a long term monitoring of this population in order to understand uh, whether the hybrids are. Uh, producing like this uh, spaces which are sharing uh, sharing spaces okay Devans is asking how many Indian primate species are endangered at the moment endangered yes. okay so I, I I really need to see this uh, uh, which were which are the spaces which are endangered Bullock gibbon is endangered lion tail macaque is endangered uh, then uh, cap langur is endangered, golden langur is endangered. So I think just you just have to check the uh, Ayushian site. So I, I, I should have done that. Uh, but remember, most of these are uh, threatened. So either they are vulnerable or endangered, but we do not have a critically endangered species. That's a good news. Okay. And Amrita is asking, sir, what is your opinion on captive breeding programs associated with primates and the reintroduction of those to the wild as far as the endangered species like gibbons are concerned? Okay, so uh, I think captive breeding is still uh, still from if you, if you if you ask my opinion, I say no, not uh, we haven't reached up to that level where we need to interfere and uh, bring them and do captive breeding and you know captive breeding is is uh, it's easier said than done right so i have seen the uh, captive breeding program of pygmy hog it needs resources it needs huge huge resources and it needs human uh, like a uh, herculean effort so i have seen people uh, doing that okay so still what what i'm saying uh, uh, to earlier questions also we still have uh, uh, say hope of restoring some of this forest okay so uh, so i was i was whenever uh, i i meet forest department and i i keep telling them that i think if this is the time uh, this is an excellent time for us to intervene and uh, restore this forest okay because they can do and uh, they can do wonderful uh, say if uh, uh, so even even if some of the uh, restore like uh, degraded forest are being restored, I'm sure that primate will bounce back uh, in those forests. So I think uh, the reintroduction or uh, say captive breeding, I think I'm still not for that. So uh, I haven't convinced myself that uh, so far that we should do captive breeding for the uh, hula gibbon or say so 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 that's a that's the thing so we we all only like a since the gibbons are the most most charismatic we talk about gibbons but but if you look at other macaque species for example pigtail macaque or stump tail macaque we hardly have any information about them right so so i think we need to also also come out from this we need to also learn the lesson from tiger or elephants or other thing that we also so keep a very very close eye on other spaces also not only the charismatic spaces so we should also think uh, perhaps uh, uh, if you at the end you will find that uh, we may have to do a captive breeding for say pigtail mug because their population is much much lower 
we do not know about it so captive breeding i think it's a last re re resort for me uh we, first we need to exhaust the uh, uh, the available practices so even after say uh, restoration of the forest or um, doing all this preventive and the mitigative measures uh, of the forest decline if the primate population is declining rapidly then i think we, so we need to uh, intervene and do the captive breeding for, for right now i'm not uh, for this so that's my opinion okay and <clears throat> supraja mahesh is asking sir you mentioned about slow release slow release cigarettes venom by brachial gland is that venom obtained by diet or they have special type of cells that helps them in the secretion of the venom okay so i don't know about how they how they uh, so how the snake get the uh, poison so i think perhaps that may answer it so i don't know how how they get this uh, so perhaps some of the secretion uh, when they mix with the saliva it become very poisonous okay and amrita is asking sir how about the building of wildlife corridors on the existing fragmentation to bring back the connectivity between the fragment and forests if thinking about very this nice. yeah. what drop very nice question yeah a uh, very nice question but the but the problem uh, here is that yes we can do this theoretically we can do this but practically it's it's little bit difficult because uh, most of the uh, uh, like where, uh, place where i worked in upper assam the the distance between forest fragments on an average is around 2 km okay so we need to perhaps purchase so purchase the land from the uh, tea, tea garden so I, and you know it's, it's a very very uh, like a expensive affair so uh, instead of that if you can work with the uh, tea garden uh, managers or tea garden estates to to say so make a corridor so we'll not purchase it but plan uh, spaces right uh, which uh, are say uh, fast growing spaces uh and then uh some some sort of a strip that that they can uh, say uh, uh, request us to say uh, do this corridor why not right and uh, but before that we also need to think that the corridors uh, sometimes the mortalities were not not creating some say uh, so some corridors where spaces are extremely vulnerable right we need to also minimize those those th threats also so corridor uh, is is good right but i think uh, we also need to think about it that we are not in the uh, inadvertently creating say uh, areas uh, where uh, uh, the 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 species is really threatened there so that that can be done okay but the corridor can be done but i think we will do this uh, question Okay, <clears throat> and Dixita is asking, sir, I want to know about venom of slow lois. Okay, so what I can do is that I can share you that uh, uh, literature. So you can just type Anna Nekaris. Uh, so she has done a lot of work on venom, uh, this uh, venomous uh, primate or slow lois. I'm sure that you will get uh, the detail. Uh, uh, the composition or the, what what exactly the venom looks like in in those studies so just type anna nekaris uh, and uh, this is from oxford brook university uh, so you'll you'll get to know about that okay, okay. and uh, harshali is asking how researchers determine the size of troops okay so uh, size of the troop uh, you can you can do uh, so it's not like today you will you go and you get the size of the troop okay for given it is possible so it's a, it's a small maximum uh, five individuals so maximum it can go to six individuals so if you, if you uh, go around with given for the whole day you'll see all of them it is difficult when it comes to macaques okay particularly the stumpel macaque so uh, so 194 how did we come up come about that figure so what we did was uh, in the opening okay so you have seen in that video also there is a road they were crossing the road 
right? So if you can place yourself in, in, the, in that uh, place where they are crossing the road, you can count all of them. So we did that many times, okay? Or you can also do the videograph. So the 194 individuals we counted, it's not, uh, we have counted it by, uh, by recording the entire movement and identifying individuals uh, by uh, observing the recordings, okay? So it is difficult, but it is not impossible for stumptail macaque, which are mostly arboreal. And the pigtail macaque, the group size is not very big. So the pigtails are around 40, 45, or perhaps they will go up to 50. Kaplangur uh, is not a very, uh, say, huge groups. So the, the average group size is around 12 or 13 individuals. So if you if you spend a lot of time with Kaplangur, so you can identify, identification may be a little difficult, but you can uh, say, uh, come out with the uh, group size of the Kaplangur. So you have to spend a lot of time with them. And, and I agree, for some species, you need to create that opportunity where you can, uh, uh, you can count them when they are crossing some openings, where you can clearly see them. Otherwise, if you just go in the forest and you count it, it's not possible. Okay. And Saida is asking, sir, can we consider some primates as an umbrella species because their habitat is huge? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so who gave this name for umbrella species, flagship species? So it's us only, no? So uh, the, the range of, say, uh, hula gibbon, right? So I'm, I'm saying hula gibbon because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a species that needs a contiguous forest. So that means where there are hula gibbons, uh, so you... Uh, so if there are healthy population of log gibbon in some area, that means the forest is also, the connectivity is also quite good there, right? So why not uh, uh, considered uh, log gibbon as, as, a, as an umbrella species? But um, for the um, umbrella species, uh, the one of the criteria is that it should be a large ranging uh, animal. So the umbrella should be very large, right? So given the territories are not very, very large. So it could be like, uh, there could be several population of gibbons that can have so it could be a lot of small small umbrellas everywhere okay not not a big umbrella like an elephant which covers say huge area some hundreds of square kilometers okay so it can be a small small umbrellas everywhere okay and harsali is asking sir could you suggest any book or literature for the study of primates Yes, uh, there is a there is a nice book uh, by uh, Setchel. Okay, uh, Setchel. Just just let me let me check it and share it. Uh, by Setchel, uh, in how to study private or something. How to study private? Yeah. So it's an extremely good book. I think I, I suggest everyone to just a little expensive. It's uh, but you can you can check it. Okay, you can check it if uh, the soft copy is available or not. Okay. Um, hi sir. So, is the time restriction okay for you? Can we move on with the questions or? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay, so thank you. okay. Titi is asking, can we reconsider pairing for life in gibbons as there are instances which show that they do pair with different individuals? I think this, uh, the entire thing about this pairing for life is, uh, I think uh, we really need to do some paternity test, you know? So I don't think the, uh, the increasingly, the if you do the paternity test of the infant so most of the time researchers find that the the son or daughter they are thinking of is is the uh let's say product of the uh, the two male and female is actually not it's it's fathered by somebody else okay so if you if you can do the paternity test uh, uh then you'll potentially see that uh, the, the strict monogamy is not there 
Okay. And I'm not sure about this, uh, say, uh, pairing for life, because I haven't uh, observed, say, a group for, say, 25 years. So I don't know who coined this term. Uh, so if, if they have observed it for, say, 25 years, I, I think uh, uh, they must be uh, like uh, quite confident about saying that they pair for life. Otherwise, I, I don't know. So I haven't done that work. Okay. And Tanzim is asking, actually, there are three questions. Yeah. First one is, can we record stress behavior via vocal cords? Uh, so, so, can you repeat that again? Can we record stress behavior via vocal cords? Okay. Vocal calls, stress behavior. That's that, that's very interesting question. How will you do this? Uh, so, 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 you mean to say, say that any deviation from the normal call, uh, you want to attribute it to, to the stress. There could be different factors, right? How will you account for other factors? So, so the best best to study stress is to collect the fecal fecal sample and uh, run the uh, hormone test, right? But I'm not sure about the call. So if you if you can do the fecal uh, sample analysis for different, the content of different horm stress hormone, I think that will give you a very uh, good idea about whether these species are under stress or not. Or you can take the blood sample, which is not actually it's it's not impossible, but very difficult to get permits because it's a schedule one species. Uh, you need to get it from the MOEF. So that's that's a long, long journey. So the, the most non-invasive uh, process is to just collect the uh, fecal, fecal uh, sample, run the hormone, hormonal test there and see whether they are in stress or not. And different season, perhaps, whether uh, the lack of fruits or lack, lack of resources is making them more stressful. So you can, you can check that. Yeah, why not? But I don't know about the call. Okay, and the second question is about how to record the population of the non-human primate species and how to approach people while doing conservation strategy in natural habitats. If people share common boundaries and in case of zoo, how far do you think it would make a difference while creating awareness programs? Okay, so how to do uh, the survey right first first one that one can we record, okay how to record the population of the non-human primate species so yeah so non-human primate population i think um, the only thing uh, that you can do is uh, there are something called the occupancy survey also you can you can uh, grid the entire area and whether see whether this particular population is presence or absence there and from there, you can, you can create models to estimate uh, some sort of the probability of occurrence of a species there. So then that is one way. Second way, in, in, in a small forest fragments, you go and count all of them. So this is called the total count. Okay. And for, for the areas where the terrain is very uh, straight terrain, so you can do a line transit, okay, similar to uh, other one. But in a very precarious uh, terrain like uh, Arunachal or say Mizoram or, or say Meghalaya, where the, you cannot lay a lay straight, uh, the transit uh, should be straight, right? So there, the only thing is that you can do the encounter rate, okay? So you walked say 10 kilometers, you encounter this many species, this many individuals, right? So that will give you a rough idea about, it's, it's kind of a proxy for the abundance. It's a surrogate for the abundance. You can do the encounter rate. So I walk 10 kilometer, I observe three groups or I walked and, and there again, the problem would be, so if it's a, it's a, uh, it's a big size group, like, uh, so if you encounter a tail macaque, right? How will you, how will you say that you have counted all the individuals, right? So that's the, that, that's the problem with this. So. So you can you can base say we have count you have and we have encountered uh, this many group and the minimum group size 
it's not the maximum minimum group size that i encountered would be say 30 plus or 20 plus because you are not sure whether whether you have counted all the individuals right so for that you need a long term uh, commitment long term say uh, walk in those places okay the next question is how stress behavior affects the species of course they do so they do uh, the uh, space the it's just like a uh, stress can impact human uh, behavior also right it can it can compromise our immune system physiology so similar thing happen to uh, say animals also it can compromise their immune system they are more prone to diseases and it can compromise the physiology their physiology or uh, it can also make them uh, very agitated and a lot of uh, these uh, studies on elephant, they said they found that the species which are uh, uh, in the, which are present in the human dominated landscape are very stressed. So when they looked at the stress hormone level, they found the elevated stress hormone level in, in them. Right. So uh, this can make them very aggressive also. So uh, yeah, in some places, for example, rhesus macaque, you, you never know. We haven't done that work. So I do not know about it. So if you can do this stress uh, uh, hormone analysis, we may found, uh, find uh, interesting results from there. Okay. And the next question is from Muhammad Sabir Ahmed. He's asking, is there predation of primates by other animals of the forest? Yes. So the, the, there are predators like a um, common leopard, a python, and some of the raptors. So some of the raptors will, uh, some of the border prey, they will try to uh, attack the infant, okay? And there are leopards, uh, which are, uh, which actually attack uh, and uh, predate on uh, primates, and then python also. So the, the, these are the three uh, predators. And along with that, uh, in Gibbon Wildlife Sanctuary, there are there were clouded leopards also. So hopefully, uh, they were also uh, predating on uh, uh, primitive species. Okay, Abhinav Kumar is asking: Monkeys in urban establishments do they need any attention in conservation? As most of the time, they are seen to cause problems to humans. Is there any instance where steps are taken to control man monkey conflict? Uh, conservation is also about uh, like uh, uh, managing the population as well, right? So it's not only about, uh, uh, say, uh, stopping the or, say, uh, decline of a species. It's also about if there are a lot of individuals, right? Uh, uh, how to how to also manage them is also also part of the conservation i think we, have, we only looked at conservation as if all the species are declining right there may be some species which are also increasing in number how to take care of them also right of course this is this is a conservation uh, problem uh, and uh, there are instances you are right there are a lot of uh, this uh, negative interactions that that is happening with the rhesus macaque mostly rhesus macaque uh, in uh, North India uh, and uh, with bonnet macaque in South India. Okay, so they uh, there are a lot of studies that have been done in Himachal Pradesh where uh, uh, they uh, utilize the sterilization process. Okay, so where they sterilize the male and female uh, and they try to contain the population of uh, rhesus macaque in that state. So they, with some success okay so uh, so hope, uh, they are hoping that the population of the rhesus macaque can come down from this sterilization process so uh, you can you can check uh, the uh, the work of neva singh of mysore university and his group uh, on how they they have done this in himachal pradesh okay and tandrim is asking Sir, what are your views on captive primate species? Is there any influence of zoo visitors on macaques as such? Uh, what are your views on captive primate species? Is there any influence of zoo visitors on macaques as such? 
uh, Jews are mostly like uh, the 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 importance of Jew is that uh, one is that uh, if you visit a Jew, you get to know about the species. Okay, first, and second, our Jew are uh, particularly in uh, say European countries. Uh, so Jews are very important areas for the captive breeding program. Okay, one of the one of the mandate of Jew is that uh, you can do a uh, captive breeding program in Jew. Okay, uh, so uh, so there are lot of primate captive primate species also. Okay, but uh, according to Wildlife Protection Act, uh, so you cannot so, say uh, keep primate as a captive in captivity. So if you are doing this. Uh, I think we all always uh, remember that we should always remember that these are the wild animal. Okay, so you have seen that the COVID, how it uh, is spread, right? So I think we need to also respect uh, the wild uh, in its wildest form. Okay, and uh, recently what is happening? I think you guys have also read in the newspaper that um, there are a lot of seizures of. Uh, 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 so exotic primate species. So the primate species, which are not from uh, India, okay. So these are being seized. So people somewhere else, I think, are uh, wanted this as a pet in India, okay. So mm -hmm. so if if we just search this uh, different primate species which are uh, being captured in uh, Assam, so. You'll, you'll be see, you'll be surprised to see the frequency of this capture okay so people wanted it for for some strange reason you know uh, uh, so people are uh, in some places they wanted to keep slow loris as, as a as a pet okay so one of the major threat to slow loris survival uh, or loris survival in southeast asia is that people wanted uh, to keep them as a pet that's why a uh, uh, lot of individuals are being extracted uh, from the wild and being sold. Okay, so I think that is not uh, advisable at all. Okay, and Muhammad Sabir Ahmed is asking how effective the satellite tagging is to study primates. Uh, it's it's very good if you if you really want to understand uh, say the home range right the habitat utilization pattern of say uh, say primate so but but with the primate it is the, the the good thing is about primate is that if you can do this you will get fantastic data so that's there is no doubt about it but uh, so same thing uh, with the primate you can do with the help of a handheld GPS. So every every say 15 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever predefined time, if you can take the GPS location. So at the end, you will get uh, the the entire home range, you know, like a, a after after a year, uh, if you if you just connect these dots or make some uh, polygons. So you will you will see that, okay, winter they, this is their home range in uh, summer this is their home range and uh, during each day they are traveling to this path and they are they are say walking or they are moving this many kilometer okay so that i think if, if you can do the satellite tagging it's a fantastic idea but again uh, you'll you'll uh, get trouble in getting permits okay because you need to capture them and uh, when you capture them, it's a, it's a social animal, right? So you need to be, uh, there should be some protocol that you need to follow. You need to get permits, you need to get experts to so tranquilize them. So there are a lot of these other things that uh, that are that are needed, okay? Uh, particularly in, in India, I think it's, it's very, very difficult to get uh, uh, species uh, tagged with satellite. And, and uh, moreover, the expense, is quite high okay and then the, and the uh, very uh, low expense uh, alternative is to just follow the group with the help of the handheld gps okay and silpi choudhury is asking what are the various career options in wildlife both academic and non-academic options do we need to first assist any wildlife project after bachelors 
or directly persuade masters in wildlife to contribute in this field so one thing uh, uh, what you are doing is that attending this kind of uh, webinars right so these are the uh, so since you are you are here you are listening to it and you are answering it, uh, asking the question itself saying that you are interested in in wildlife okay uh, absolutely there are both academic i think you can uh, you can uh, do masters in uh, uh, say wildlife ecology there are the fantastic institute uh, like uh, wildlife institute of india uh, then ncbs that's national center for biological sciences and there are other other areas where uh, people, uh, like uh, the universities are offering uh, say uh, masters in wildlife okay so that is one option so uh, then you can you can uh, finish the masters then you can apply for phd position whether in india or abroad okay so don't rule out the possibility of getting phd abroad so you will get it so if you, if you really uh, plan your career nicely and you you know like what you really wanted to do right so definitely you will be able to um, get a phd abroad also okay but it's it's so it's a very very useful idea to whenever uh, there are there are opportunity for say uh, say intern right or assist someone in the wildlife project you can even do it right now right uh, not not compromise of course not compromising with your uh, classes or daily uh, so what you are doing it uh, now but uh, in your free time such sunday or saturday if, if there are there are somebody who, who needs help you can go and and uh, you can actually uh, help them collecting data and this will also help you if you, if you get into uh, say the wildlife science, like a ncbs masters interview so this will help you okay or in wildlife institute of india's masters this will help you uh, in the in the interview that you can say that okay i have done this i have i've also worked as a as an intern in this project so that uh, you can also add in your cv so then your cv looks better okay and you will also get the first an idea about it uh, then also this will also give you an uh, opportunity uh, to uh, to uh, find out what you actually like so you may think that you you are uh, you are liking say uh, say uh, some ecological questions but you may later on you will find that after some project you may find that okay i uh, I'm, I'm really interested in in behavior or say evolution or in say phylogeny or say so i do not want to do any any uh, academic work i just wanted to go and conserve the species right so that also you can do you can also uh, uh, volunteer and work with the people and also if there are some NGOs wildlife NGOs which are there working in your areas you can go volunteer with them as well okay thank you sir those are all the questions okay so thank you very much sir so it's been a privilege for me to be asked to propose the oath of thanks on this occasion. I, Vaishali, on behalf of the Nature's Eye, would like to express my gratitude to each and every one of you for your presence and contribution to make this webinar a great success. I extend my gratitude to our speaker, Dr. Narayan Sharma, who took our time from his busy schedule to grace the event. And I'd like to express our sincere thanks to you, sir, for giving us an excellent insight into the world of primates. We're all inspired by your great works. And I must thank the Nature's Eye for providing us with the opportunity and my team for working hard for the past few months to make this webinar a successful one. Once again, I want to state that we are all grateful to Dr. Sharma and we thank you for being with us this evening. It's been a great pleasure, sir. Thank you. A very big thank you to all the participants for being a part of this webinar. And the attendance link for the webinar have been shared in the chat box. Please do fill this as soon as possible to receive our certificates. A quick update, uh, we have an upcoming two days webinar on the frog ecology and bioacoustics on 19th and 20th of November. So if you wish to register, there are discounts available 
And for the participants of this webinar, you will be receiving a special discount. So please do contact us. And regarding your e-certificates, uh, you will be receiving it in about four to five working days. So thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank so you much. very much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I request all the participants to stay for five more minutes. We'll be sending the attendance uh, sheet link again. So please fill it up before leaving. The link has been sent again, so all of you please fill it up so that we are able to send you your e-certificates. And if you've already uh, filled it, you can leave the session now. <laughs> 